When, as a festival director, you begin programming a festival like this, you start by making a list of all the writers you most admire and would most like to have. And then at some stage, it becomes like a game of Pelmanism or Scrabble. You have to start putting them together, and you work out the patterns between the different people that you've invited. Very rarely do things come together as beautifully as, as these two paired books. Last year, quite separately, uh, I sent off to Amazon for, uh, no, I got a nice one actually from you, <laughs> anyway, but I sent off to Amazon for Inner Lives of Empire. Uh, and uh, these two books tell very similar stories about empire, about the exploitative and cruel economics of empire, but they do so from, in a sense, opposite ends of the telescopes. The Inner Life of Empires, Emma Rothschild's brilliant study of the Johnson family, this extraordinary globalized Scottish family who, uh, like so many from my native land, erupted out of the most impoverished, provincial, rugged country uh, in, in the 18th century. Suddenly, these Scots were projected all over the world, and these Johnsons, who'd made very little impression in history before then, other than by rustling sheep and... and, and cattle of their neighbors uh, suddenly found themselves at the center of the Enlightenment, at the center of the American, French, uh, Indian revolutions. Uh, and um, this obscure clan gets suddenly at the very forefront of world history. And Emma has pieced together from archives uh, all over the place uh, the story of, of generations of this family linking different ends of empire. Very uh, similar way that Linda Coley with, with her uh, trans, uh, 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 trans migratory um, Elizabeth Marsh pulls together the different worlds of empire that are usually written differently. You normally read one book about uh, the empire in the Caribbean, another about what's going on uh, in Britain, and a third about what's happening in India. But families and individuals often span uh, these great uh, geographical chasms. Uh, and Emma knits it all together and, and excavates not just the outer political life, but the, uh, the inner workings of their minds, their, uh, their minds and sentiments, as Adam Smith, in a very nice quote that uh, Emma has at the beginning of her book. Um, <coughs> Gautra Bahadur tells the other end of the story of plantations and, uh, uh, and empire, the story uh, of uh, those exploited by that system, uh, working in the plantations of the sort that the Johnsons owned. Uh, and so between them, although the two books cover slightly different time frames, uh, they tell um, two sides of a very interesting story. We thought we'd manage this by asking Emma to speak first, describing her book, uh, then Gertrude, and then we'll come together, knit the themes together, and then open it up to you lot uh, to uh, open questions. So maybe if we start with Emma. Well... Thank you very, very much indeed. It's, a, it's an enormous pleasure to be here in Jaipur with two such wonderful <laughs> historians of semi-Indian and very extended households. Um, and it's a pleasure to talk a bit about the eccentric, very eccentric 18th century Johnstons. It's also an unexpected pleasure to be in the Mughal Google <laughs> tent. Um, the, um, the, uh, story of the Johnstons was actually very much about Mughals, and it's also about Google, so I want to come back <laughs> to this. <laughs> um, yeah. um, so the Johnstons were a large, odd, and resilient Scottish family of seven brothers and four sisters who set out to make their fortunes in the mid-18th century. They succeeded, at least for a while, and the basis was A, the so-called presents, which were more or less bribes, that two of the brothers received, sometimes interestingly enough in wheelbarrows, from <laughs> Mughal administrators, especially in Murshidabad. So the second source of their fortune was the marriage of a third brother to a, um, the, a rather implausible heiress to a large accumulation of English commercial property. So the family then invested their strange gotten fortune in, and this is where the beginning of the connection, sugar plantations in the West Indies. 
And they were very interested in Burbese, but they were just too early. They knew about Burbese ah. and Guiana. So I started off to write the history of these um, brothers and sisters, and particularly, actually, of the ones who never really went anywhere. But the story changed direction entirely fairly soon in the process. And this is where Google comes in. One of the things I, of course, did obsessively and repetitively in the course of writing the book was to search for the Johnstons by their names. One day, and actually I was searching more than usually obsessively, not just for the name Johnston, but for various common misspellings of the name. And anyone who's worked with 18th century stuff knows that it's really important to search for Johnst Johnston, if one's looking for Johnston. Anyway, so I was looking for some common misspelling, and I did find the reference which completely changed the story. It was a reference to a record in the National Archives of Scotland about a woman called Belle or Belinda. It had actually been uploaded by a short-lived project of public history called CASBA, Caribbean Studies, Black and Asian History. And it was the record of a trial for infanticide in Scotland in 1771. The defendant was described as a black woman, a native of the kingdom of Bengal, and the slave or servant of John Johnston. He was actually the brother with the Murshidabad wheelbarrows connection. So, so I found the record of Bell's trial in the National Archives of Scotland, and I found many other records as well. She petitioned the court to be banished to the East or West Indies or to America, and she was sent, in the end, to Virginia, there to be sold as a slave for life. She was, I believe, the last person ever to be deemed to be a slave by a court in the British Isles. And I never found what happened to her after a simple receipt for her arrival in 1772 in Williamsburg, Virginia, on the eve of the American Revolution. But she became, essentially, the center of the book. So what sort of history is it that all three of us do in writing these macro, micro histories of families? A sort of history that has become astonishingly wi widespread in recent years and is a part of the revival of nonfiction that we're going to be talking about later in the festival. It's a particular pleasure that one of the great writers in this genre, Maya Jasanoff, will be here at, in Jaipur. Well, I think part of the answer has to be that these histories tell stories. In my case, The Inner Life of Empires started out as a series of lectures in 2006, and I was very conscious when I was wondering what I could talk about that I wanted to end the first day of the lectures in such a way that people would want to come back on the following day, <laughs> the old technique of serial fiction. But I think the the interest in these micro, macro family histories does correspond to really interesting changes in historical writing at the moment. One obvious one is the trend away from national narratives. People are much less interested than they were in the great dramas of national unification and independence and civil, um, civil conflict and and, um, um, and, in a sense, also economic development. I think, in, even more generally, there's a move away from macro histories, the, the rise of capitalism, the, um, the rise of nationalism. It's, it's not, um, it doesn't correspond quite to what people want to write. I think there's a third reason that's interesting, which is that the old fascination with history from below sort of vanished, partly because people felt it has to be either collective history, mass social history without people in it, or it has to be 
anthropological, also without real people in it. And somehow, and I, this, I think particularly of this in your book, there's a real possibility through these family histories to get at a history from below, which is a history of people and their lives. Um, another reason that is important comes back to Google again. I do think there's a, an affinity between this kind of history and the new techniques of, of digital history and digital searches. Um, we, a lot of the records that, that you and I use haven't themselves been digitized, but just the process of finding where the records are and looking for people by their name, the name as the red thread in the archive, although in your case, the names aren't there, and in, in the case of Bell or Belinda, um, it isn't, it's a completely joke name, it, it isn't a real name, but still, the, there are new possibilities of sort of going from one place to another in the virtual world, which help, is propitious for this kind of history. In a way, the most important thing, perhaps, about the kind of history we're trying to do has to do with empathy, that it is a way of thinking oneself into the lives of people in the past, which is a very important part of thinking with history. Um, so, um, finally, the relationship to family history. I mean, this is the history of families, and then there's the history of, there's family history, which is the history of one's own family. I think in your book, you brilliantly do both. It's the history of your family, and it's also um, a family history of much wider, um, uh, a much wider historical interest. But I think there's, there's an interesting distinction between, in a way, the, the vertical of family history, where you're tracing, not in your work, but where you're tracing a lineage from the ancestor down to me. Um, and the horizontal of some of these family histories where you're, you're looking for who were the friends of these people in the past? Who were their neighbors? What were their lives like? And there's a different vertical, I suppose, of historical time, which is not just how, how do you get to me and, and, and my roots. So this is connected, finally, really, to, to um, the interest in social networks. I think we all think with networks now. Um, and it, it's very interesting to think of people in the past, even illiterate people in the past, like Bell or Belinda, like the people you write about, as themselves existing in social networks. I mean, I've, um, um, I've tried to do some work with social network visualization in relation um, to the Inner Life of Empires is actually a website. Innerlifeofempires.org has masses of maps and social and, and network visualizations and Google Maps and, and continuations and new pieces of evidence that have shown up. And, I, and it is, it's changing the way that people do history. History is becoming more incomplete with more silences as we were discussing together. But to, just to conclude, I think um, the empathy part is really the, is the essence of it. I mean, on the, on the website, I have a picture of um, <coughs> the bridge in Fife in Scotland where I believe Bell or Belinda stood. It's an old stone bridge. You know, I stood there and thought about her, and one thinks about the past in a very different way. And just coming back to the Mughals, my friend Bhavani Rahman suggested that when Bell or Belinda went deeper and deeper and deeper into the interior of the Johnston's house to give birth on her own, she was actually recreating the old ritual of Kanazad, which would give additional palace, rights palace to her born. Dog. Yes, palace born. So, so I think one can go deep, try to go deep inside historical people, and then it opens out to a much larger world. So I think this genre is not 
going to vanish immediately. The force of history is with it. Um, before we move on to Gajah, could you talk a little bit about slavery in India? So much of um, our idea of slavery is connected to the West Indies. Um, what, what, was the, what was the legal framework of slaves in India? There were slaves brought from Africa, historically, yes. from Ethiopia uh, to the Deccan all through the Middle Ages. And as late as the 18th century, you're getting the, uh, or the early, early 19th century even, you're getting the Nawabs of Avad importing black slaves. Yes. Um, uh, and even in, in Hyderabad, you have um, black units right up until 1949. What is, the, what, what is the, the relation, what sort of slavery is going on in this country? in the 18th and 19th century? Well, it's, um, I mean, it's, it's known as domestic slavery in contrast to chattel slavery. Actually, the classic um, African slave trade trading was going on on behalf of the East British East India Company in the, in the 18th century. I mean, Clive was involved in, in slave trading journeys that went from the east coast of Africa to, um, to, uh, to Sumatra <coughs> and um, the East India Company. Taking, taking black workers taking to black, plantations. Well, uh, uh, the plantation system really was not established in the same form in India then. That was, that actually one of the Johnstons was, was involved in developing the plantation system in the Gulf of Mexico in the modern day Alabama. So, so, yes, domestic slavery in India was legally a different, a very different condition from chattel slavery in, from the Roman Empire to the, to the Americas, um, and I guess also to parts of the East Indies. But the, and this is something that comes very importantly out of your work, I mean, the, the line between degrees of unfreedom is a very difficult one to identify. And I think the courts were very conscious of this. I mean, they, again, again and again, the Scottish courts use this phrase, slave or servant, or servant or slave. They didn't know um, um, quite what was what, but they did send her to be sold as a slave for life. So they knew that they were taking a slave from one system. These are, you know, Scottish judges sitting in Perth um, and sending her to be enslaved in another system. But what was her status in India when she first hooked up with the Johnsons? Um, she, well, I mean, how do I know? Yeah. I was in, I, I've, I've haunted the archives of Bardawan trying to find, <laughs> find any sight of her. I haunt Virginia trying to, trying to find her. There, there, the, the thing is, there are no paper records of these transactions. The, the word slave was used frequently in British India in the 18th century. She, she wasn't a free person. Um, a, a woman, another woman who was sent from, from actually from Madras, uh, accompanying a child who was being sent back to Scotland, um, was returned to India on the grounds that she was a slave and had to be sent back to, to, to India. She couldn't be kept in, in England. So, so nobody knew. It was, a, it, it was a regime of transition in the multiple laws that sort of overlapping and, and con sometimes conflicting laws that govern the, the, the um, personal status in 18th century India. Because in, in India also you have a tradition in the Middle Ages, Richard Eaton, Dick Eaton writes about this in mm -hmm. his Deccan Social Studies, um, of black slaves who have been sold into slavery in uh, into Muslim courts in the Deccan, yes. rising to become rulers, becoming first generals. Then you have Malik Kafur, who's, oh, really? uh, who's the great opponent of Jahangir, uh, who oh. Jahangir, there's a famous and beautiful picture of Jahangir um, taking, this, uh, taking a bow and arrow uh, yes. and, uh, and um, trying to put an yes. arrow into the head of Malik, uh, Malik Kafur. Um, so th as in the Islamic world, slaves could rise up in India yeah. to, power, to great power and prestige within the, kind of, uh, within the military slavery system. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure in this, 
august audience, there's an expert on the Mughal law of slavery. Yeah. How can one have a Mughal Google tent, tent without <laughs> some legal historians okay. here? Now, to, let's move on to your, your story now. T take it away. Yeah. It's a great, great pleasure to be here. And um, I really enjoyed Emma's book and was so taken by the figure of Belle and Belinda, sort of mm -hmm. this ghostly presence at the center of your book. Um, there is a ghostly presence at the center of my book, my great-grandmother. Um, and uh, there are many reasons for, for gaps in the historical records. You know, flood or fires can destroy archives. Then uh, there are the more subtle cataclysms, the structural kind that keep documents from ever existing in the first place because of the way power wielded or withheld mutes certain people you know, born into the wrong class, race, or gender. Um, a historian in Trinidad, Kusha Harik Singh, talks about the need to free ourselves from the tyranny of the text in recovering subaltern histories. And he's right, the text is tyrannical. It was written by those in positions of power who obviously had a vested interest in telling the story from their own perspectives. Um, and the perspectives of the indentured, for the most part, are missing because they were not literate. They didn't leave behind letters or diaries or other written traces of themselves. There are only two in memoirs of indenture that exist, and both were written by men, not surprisingly. So the silence in the archives applies especially to women, um, a fact which made my task a challenge, of course, because my book traces the journey of my great-grandmother from Calcutta to the Caribbean to British Guyana in 1903. When she left India, she was four months pregnant and traveling alone without a husband. Um, so the mystery of her exit from India is, is sort of what drives my narrative. Uh, but this, this private family story, this private mystery, broadens into uh, a public history of a wider group, um, the quarter million women who left India as indentured laborers or coolies. Uh, the vast majority of them were traveling alone as she was. Quarter of a million. Quarter of a million, yes, women. Um, part of the, the larger migration of more than a million indentured laborers. And um, the traffic in police from India was actually a third the size of the British slave trade. Um, it was a significant mass movement of people, but it's sort of a forgotten aftermath of the abolition of slavery. Um, so I think of my book as an attempt to recover a lost history within a lost history, the story of Indian women within the story of Indian indenture. But despite the gaps in the archives, I was able to catch glimpses of them in their journey from India to the West Indies. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to share some of those glimpses with you today. I'm going to read three passages from, from the book, three short passages, um, each anchored by an image. Um, if we have those queued up. Yes, OK. Uh, the first passage is called The Woman's Quarters, and it's set in northern India in the 1880s. The very summer my great-grandmother crossed the Atlantic, a debate was raging over a law intended to keep married women from deserting their homes for the colonies. No woman could immigrate without her husband's permission. If she claimed to be single and officials thought she was lying, she could be detained as constables checked her story. This extra scrutiny of women resulted from the travels of two English civil servants in the remoter parts of northern India in the early 1880s. They were sent to investigate claims of all kinds of ill doings in the recruitment of coolies for the West Indies, Fiji, and Mauritius. The reports they filed and the diaries they kept provide fleeting glimpses of the women targeted, targeted as potential immigrants. At times, it almost feels like these elusive figures are peeking through the pages from behind a curtain separating the women's quarters from the rest of the house of official history. That's exactly the way Major D.G. Pitcher encountered a handful of women at a depot for recruits. It was just someone's house, a hive of tiny, dirty rooms that competing recruiters had den denounced as a disgrace to emigration. Allegedly, there was no licensed recruiter in sight, and the women were falsely kept there under promise of marriage. Pitcher, who was a, a minor judge in Lucknow, had been assigned to scrutinize recruitment in the northwestern provinces. When he visited the discredited depot, he found several rakish-looking men loafing around, but only three recruits, two men and a woman, 
As soon as Pitcher left, recruiters from other depots pounced on him, claiming that the house was actually bursting with women who had been concealed from him. Pitcher returned immediately to check it out. I took the people by surprise, he wrote, and found about half a dozen more women who rushed into an inner, inner room and were said to be Purda. Hmm. Of course, I could not on this insist on their coming out. Confronted with a tradition that had kept women from the prying eyes of outsiders for centuries, Pitcher had no choice. He had to interview them from outside a closed door. The women told him, through an interpreter, that they were not coolies bound for the co sugar colonies. They were concubines, they said, in relationships with various men living in the house. Had the women disappeared behind closed doors because the specter of a white man with authority terrified them? Were they really in Purda? Or did they have something to hide? They might have concealed their true identities using false names and invented pasts to sign up for indenture. Or they might have been recruiting for the colonies. Officially, women weren't allowed to recruit, but many of them did so regardless. Delegated by male recruiters, they convinced other women to board ships bound for British plantations abroad. Main Paris, the district where Pitcher encountered the women hiding behind the door, had a reputation as a good place to find women for the colonies. The number of its recruits was so high that Pitcher wondered aloud in his diary if it had, quote, anything to do with the existence of canals and the as frequently asserted impotence of men in canal districts. <laughs> Women seem to outnumber men drastically in the streets. Okay. So the second passage is um, set uh, at the depot in Calcutta from which indentured immigrants waited for their ships to a new world. And, um, it's where my great-grandmother waited for her ship. I tried to imagine my great-grandmother in this setting, preparing to board the Clyde in 1903. How did she ever get to this point of departure, surrounded by so many fragmented families and outcasts, bearing secrets and unstated loss? Did she look back over her shoulder as she boarded the ship? Was there regret in her glance? I don't know, because she didn't say. But I do know the story of one woman who had no regrets when she left Garden Reach in 1916. Maharani could not remember her parents' names by the time she told her story in a voice frail with age. She was a child when they died. They weren't there for her wedding to a much older man whose name she couldn't remember either. Maharani was five when she got married, and she was still just a child, only 12 when widowed. Soon after, her brother-in-law took her to a magistrate's office where, too young to know any better, she ceded the rights to her inheritance from her husband. For eight years after his death, she cooked and cleaned for her in-laws, bearing their beatings for minor mishaps. Much like the one that ultimately triggered her journey to Trinidad, she left literally over spilled milk. Maharani had just boiled milk for her in-laws when a cat crept up to lick the pot. She pelted the cat, the cat fell over, and the pot capsized. Anticipating another thrashing, and suddenly unwilling to accept one, she slipped out while her in-laws were eating. In 1987, Maharani explained why she fled. I said, I'm gonna beat me, because I get in too much licks. I said, them go beat me. I run, and I tell nobody I'm leaving. On the road, later that night, she met a man with one foot at a well. When he heard her predicament, if you don't complete this task, you don't earn your day's shilling. And I mean, many indentured immigrants, therefore, became indebted to the plantation and had to re-indenture. As a sort of bonded labor. As bonded labor. Yeah. So I mean, the interesting thing about indenture, you talked about exploitation, and there is a great deal of exploitation. Um, but indenture sort of exists somewhere in, in this, this this middle ground between slavery and freedom, especially for the women, um, there were sort of fragile openings for, for empowerment because they were in short supply on the plantation. So, I mean, that's why it's such a fertile and interesting subject to me is because it's, it's not clearly one thing or the other, but exists in this sort of fraught middle ground. That's absolutely fascinating. Did um, y your Johnson, you, uh, you write at the beginning that six of your Johnsons were slave owners and two were abolitionists. Yeah. Do you get a debate within the family very, very clearly on, on the morality of all this? I, I think it, it, there must have been. It's 
one of the, it's one of the silences. I think the only evidence of it is that the two of the brothers who were clearly on opposite sides stopped talking to each other or corresponding, but that's all, that, that, that's all I know about, I mean, one, you know, one thinks what was it like on Christmas Day with the Johnstones <laughs> when they were, but, but it's interesting, the, just on in Dempshire, I, I found the ship that Bell or Belinda went, was sent to America on, and there were a number of indentured white Scots people mm. on it. Um, and there were also people who'd been sent, um, who'd been convicted of minor crimes and were sent exactly in that way for five years. And, but she was unlike all her shipmates in that she was actually going to be sold as this, a This is a very important point because in the Highlands you get, um, we think of it so much as being uh, uh, something associated with poor Indians or enslaved blacks. Mm. But uh, in the Highlands, you're getting Highland chieftains selling their clansmen yes. to uh, plantation owners. And the, the, and, and the whole colonies of Scots, Highlanders, are shipping yeah. off to, the, to Canada and to, uh, as, as indentured laborers, in, particularly after the Highland clearances in the 1880s, uh, um, 1890s. Uh, yes. And, and I, I mean, I looked at the ads for runaway slaves in the Virginia newspapers, and there are quite a few uh, identified as being East Indian. Others, of course, are Scots. But I do think, I think it's important to, to say, too, that there was a huge flow of, of, of Chinese indentured um, labor yes, under, under terrible circumstances mostly to the western part of North America, but, but right across the continent. Do you, do you get any sense of, of the choice people make to stay on? Those who, who end up in Fiji or the Caribbean or Guyana, mm -hmm. are, they, are they unable to get home because they haven't saved up the money or the, mm -hmm. the promise is broken, or are they making a choice for a new life that they hope is going to be better? Or what, what's going on in their heads? Yeah, uh, only about a third of the immigrants returned to India, and many of those who did return had a really bad time of it. Um, because of, of sort of this idea of the Kalapani, the once you've crossed the dark waters, you have lost caste. So those that returned found, in many cases, that they were not accepted back into their villages. So those guys we see in Calcutta Harbor saying, don't go, don't go, are, have, got, have got a horrible time ahead of them back in their village. They do indeed, yeah. Oh. And that many of them end up in, um, uh, along the riverside in, in, in Calcutta, in, in slums, basically, waiting for ships to take them back, back to... to um, but in, in terms of, of those who decided to stay, these are the ones who I think were really rather quite, quite sensible, like my great-grandmother, realizing that she had made a life for herself in British Guyana and acquired things such as you know, a husband not of her caste, Guyana-born children, that would make that return really quite hard, if not impossible. This is familiar to me largely through Amitav Ghosh, through uh, Sea of Poppies and yes, so on. Is, yeah. it, is it very accurate? Do, is his picture uh, one that you recognize from your research? Yeah, I mean, it, it definitely is his picture of, of life on, on the boats and um, the, the interaction between different groups of, of immigrants um, and the way that the boats were partitioned. For instance, in the front, they were single men. Spo single right. men were supposed to stay in the middle, married couples, and at the back, single women. So all of that is real. I mean, his, his, his research is quite, quite phenomenal. Uh, but there, there's another wonderful book called have you, uh, Crossing the Bay of Bengal. It just come out, yeah. Yes, wonderful yeah. book by Sunil Amrith about m movements within um, Indian, Indian waters, Ocean, yeah. Indian Ocean waters, yeah. How much of this is, there's another wonderful book called Sugar and Power, from 20 yes. odd years ago, yes, which yes. makes the thesis that all of this is because of the taste of sweetness. I've mm. just come out of the tent where Hugh Fernley Whittingstall was mm. trying to, uh, talking about trying to stop British mm. people eating too many sweeties. Uh, and this, this, how far is this entire thing, three million slaves, a million indentured labors, entirely driven by a need for sweetness and, and, and sort of tea and sugar? Well, in sugar and tea, I mean, sorry. Well, in the French uh, Empire, it was driven by a need for coffee, which of course is a very serious <laughs> need. Um, but, um, um, and, and the Chinese in indentured laborers were building railroads and, and sort of clearing, clearing the land. So, so, so I think non-free labor went right across the enterprise of modern industrial growth in the period from 
the end of the 18th century to the middle of the 20th century, to the, to the rubber plantations. I mean, the, the Tamils who, who went under terrible conditions to, to the Malayan Peninsula were clearing, uh, the, clearing the jungle for the rubber plantations for the automobile industry that's all around us in modern India. What so date is this? This is, this is, um, this is 20th century. Um, absolutely, it, one of the largest movements of, of migrant labor under terrible conditions was from both from India and from China to the Malayan Peninsula, a lot of it in connection with plantations. And do you get any sense um, from the Johnsons of, of um, deep moral qualms about what they're in, in, engaged in? Do you, uh, I mean, they, they're good letter writers, your Johnsons. They're, they're very articulate. They're friends of philosophers. They know Adam Smith. They know David Hume. Are they, are they taking what we would... I mean, have they got the, the reactions we would have to a system of, of, of labor and exploitation? Well, there's one of them, a, 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 the, a deeply eccentric one. It inherits the plantation in Grenada when his younger brother dies. And he immediately sends shoes for all his slaves, and then he sends a plow and a plowman from the <laughs> west of Scotland. So he wants to he wants to make he says he wants to make conditions of labor for the slaves better, and he wants to free them soon. And then he dies. But he was hugely mocked by the the sort of theorists of slavery as as the example of the totally clueless man <laughs> from, um, from Dumfries who sent all these shoes. And this is, this is delving right. The, the man he sent, the plowman he sent, created a family in Grenada, lived there happily for 25 years. His sister changed the name of her daughter to his name. So his daughter, his niece back in Scotland had a male name, and lo and behold, she did inherit a fortune from Grenada. <laughs> I, I'm very intrigued by this book. You have a brief appearance in your book of, of James Bailey Fraser, who turns up in my books. That's right, um, yes. my, my wife's forebear, uh, who, whose brother, William Fraser, commissions the Fraser album. And in terms of, of British imperialists in India, James Bailey Fraser is one of the most liberal and, um, and open-minded and, mm. um, and, and William embraces the whole mogul thing and dresses up as a mogul and has his long whiskers and so right. on. And yet this man in his youth is a, is, is a plantation overseer. Do you get any sense of what his views are of the plantation? Um, I just wanted to say, by the way, that the, the image up when I read the Adipo chapter was James Bailey Fraser's yeah. sketch of Garden Reach. Um, That's right, yeah. Yes, uh, so I looked at the Fraser family letters, although it was dealing with a, t a century before the time that's relevant for my book, and um, you, you get really get a sense of, of James Bailey Fraser as this morose figure as, he as the it. planter. Yeah. He doesn't enjoy it at all. And there's a reference, there's a, a very enigmatic reference to uh, the good creature who made my life so comfortable, which sort of like set my imagination ablaze as to who that could have been. Because um, a great part of my work looks at relationships between Scots overseers, well, overseers in general, but many of them were Scots and Indian women on the plantations, um, which of course built on an, this earlier history of, of um, intimacies that were forbidden between plantation managers and overseers and, and the women who worked for them as slaves. It, it interests me very much again, because it goes so much against our image of imperialism, how th the possibilities of, of all these different um, James Kirkpatrick, the hero of my white moguls, yes. who has this relationship with Karen Nisa, who he marries. Mm. Um, his own father was half Creole from plantations in an 18th century relationship. Uh, and so you have these kind of multiple yeah. bloods going on, there, and they, they still keep the name Kirkpatrick and think of them, themselves as Scottish. Yeah, and I, I, I kept coming across instances or details that suggested warmth, you know, like actual intimacy in these relationships, although they were clearly relationships of in which power. one of yeah. power, um, uh, you know, one plant, one plantation manager after his um, his m mistress died, um, erected um, uh, a memorial tour 
um, near his near his house, and the inscription was, um, you know, to my dear Elizabeth, gone but not forgotten. And you have to really sort of, it's an act of empathy, like you said, to put yourself in, in their position and to imagine what might have been going on in that relationship. There's an extraordinary example of that in Lucknow. Claude Martin, who builds La Martinia School, and who makes his money in very exploitative indigo plantations. Um, he erects a huge tomb to his mistress, Boulogne, um, and gives a sum of money to be given out to the poor of Lucknow. And to this day, I filmed this in a documentary, uh, a crowd gathers once a, once a month at Boulogne's tomb. Oh, uh, money nice. left in whatever it is, 1799 at his death, oh, yeah. uh, is still given out. It's now only 20 rupees to each, each person that comes. Yeah. And an accountant who is the descendant of, of Claude Martin's own descendant sits in a, in, in a desk at the bottom of the tomb and gives out money to crowds oh, of people, oh, which is lovely. So. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> anyway we, we've um, exhausted <coughs> uh, nearly our time, but we have... Uh, ten more minutes or uh, eight more minutes for questions. So over to you guys. My question is to Mrs. Emma Rothschild. Uh, there are a lot of places in this world where people don't want to work. And uh, do you think that uh, slavery will return in this enlightened age? Well, Do you think that's the solution? Um, yeah. <laughs> um, um, well, ac actually, there's, um, it, it's a very serious question because there is slavery. There is mm. something, there is a phenomenon Akin. that is very close to slavery in the modern world, in many parts of the modern world. And that there, there is a wonderful organization that's fighting existing slavery that, um, um, that, that exists in the world. I don't, I mean, I, I'm an enough of an enlightenment believer to think that anti-slavery is one of the most robust forces in our international civil society now. So I don't think it's going to, it's going to come back. But I think vigilance on where it still exists is a really, really important cause. And I, I, rec I commend the slavery yearbook, which does document horrifying things. I mean, there was a, at Harvard, there was a, a, a l for many years, there was a course on the history of slavery from ancient times. And they always ended with a guest lecture from someone who had been a slave. Okay. Yeah. Goodness. I mean, there are people who have been enslaved in the world today. My question concerns methodology. Uh, did you use financial records to fill in the silences? Uh, the example I think of is, as a reader, uh, Simon Shama, you know, when he's discussing the East India Company, he gives a lot of financial details that adds, uh, it, it adds the whole picture to the reader, like when he describes how money is raised for the Victorian Memorial. So was there financial detail about transactions of, you know, people being paid or exchanges or whatever that really fleshed the story? Oh, uh, uh, absolutely. And, and just on the question of sort of historical method, you know, economic history has become a really boring subject in many respects, which it's about nothing but the rise of finance. But actually, financial records are extraordinarily rich for all the kinds of history that we do. And just to give you an example, <coughs> some of the documents I worked with were the financial records of the plantation in Grenada. And they included mortgages, huge long mortgage documents, but they, they were mortgages in part on living people. So in, in the British colonies, unlike in the French colonies, you could take out mortgages on living human beings because they were chattels. So there's a large financial um, evidential base about you know, mortgages. What a boring thing, but these, are, these, in this case, they're mortgages on people. So no, I mean, I think, I think this, um, in a way, there's a sort of eclecticism, which I got very much in your book. You, you have to look for 
bits of evidence wherever you can mm. find them. And financial is one for countries with notaries. Um, that's another source of record. The, all those um, inspectors of emigrants reports. Criminal court, um, lower criminal court jurisdictions are an e extremely rich source for this sort of history. Yeah. The, the historian <coughs> Natalie Zeman Davis talks about making silences work for you, right? Yeah. So when you can't fill in those gaps, mm. is, there, is there a way you can, you can ask, really, what does this silence say? And I think you do that beautifully with Bell or Belinda in this one passage where you ask, um, well, there was no court inquiry into who the father of that child might have been. There, there are no church records relating to this. Mm. What does this tell us? What does it mm. perhaps suggest? And I thought that was really beautifully done. I tried to, in my book, make the silences in the archives a subject in and of itself to yeah. uh, sort of evoke the elusiveness of the women. Mm. Mm. But, but of course, one problem, what one has to be endlessly sort of suspicious in this sort of, because the financial records in the case of the Johnstons often were falsified. Yeah. I believe that some <laughs> crooked birth, Scots accountants. Some, some, yeah. some birth <laughs> records were falsified. You know, dates of birth were actually, you know, little little changes in the really? record. <laughs> One last question. We have time for sir. I would uh, just like to ask. I was wondering, in fact, whether any of you have dealt with a thing called when uh, that the slaves come back like to India and they were went on to be revered by the society. Like uh, in the contemporary history, like you find uh, though strictly Mahatma Gandhi didn't go as a slave, but he, when he went, he, as you said, uh, the concept of Kalapani or not crossing the yeah. seven seas, yeah. he went abroad, uh, his family was, I, if I believe, uh, it was made an outcast and then he c came back and returned to a hero's welcome sort of through various circumstances and all. Is there some relevant kind of deal you, you deal with in your books, Gandhi? Um, uh, Gandhi did have to undergo purification rites when he returned for those same reasons, yeah. right? Um, not really. I mean, I encountered people who came back and became involved in the nationalist cause. There is a man named Totaram Sanadia who was indentured in Fiji. Um, and then uh, when he returned to India, uh, became part of Gandhi's circle and wrote um, a pamphlet about indenture that was used by the nationalists. And actually, the, the fight against indenture was really the first, first victory by the nationalists in India. Yeah. Yeah. I think we've run out of time. It's lunchtime now. But please give a big round of applause for Emma Rothschild, Gacha Bahadur. Thank you. Once again, Emma Rothschild, thank you very much. Gacha Bahadur, thank you.